So tell me a little bit about methyl donors and estrogen metabolism and, and possibly things related to DIM, indole 3 carbonyl. Um, and I know your friend Jonathan Wright, uh, you two go back, you're nearly neighbors, yep. uh, talking about um, the, uh, uh, the methyl, uh, that is uh, hydroxy uh, estradiol. Mm -hmm. so, and he feels that has a profound uh, possible benefit in, in an anti-cancer program. So how do we manifest the best metabolites in hormone, and how do we minimize these potentially harmful hormone metabolites? Yeah, I think that's a really a good question. You know, estrogen is a remarkable hormone. It doesn't take much to have a lot of activity at the cellular level. It's a, what's called a mitogenic hormone, meaning it, it stimulates cellular replication, which is great if you're having a baby, uh, you want to have cellular replication. But you don't want in the adult to have cells kind of replicating wildly. That's a, a pre malignant or malignant condition. So estrogen has to be managed by the, the, the woman or the man's body. It's important to point out men have estrogen too, and it's That's important right. for their bones, and it's important for uh, the function, actually, of their steroid hormones. So if you take estrogen away from a bodybuilder entirely, uh, they can't grow muscle. And so it's, it's it, admittedly in a very much smaller level in men than females, but it's important in both genders. So. Estrogen has to be managed by the body, and it's managed by a, a series of metabolic steps that convert estrogen into a form that can be eliminated either in the bile to, through the feces or in the urine. And this occurs through what is called, as you mentioned, hydroxylation. And then that hydroxylated form of estrogen uh, gets a further uh, attachment to a methyl group to form uh, methylated estrogens, like 2-methoxyestrone, 2-methoxyestradiol, and that is kind of the estrogen break. It does the opposite of estradiol. Uh, estradiol stimulates cellular replication, 2-methoxyestradiol slows it down, so it's like the break. So it's a balance between the accelerator right. and the break, and so you want proper methylation. That means your folic acid has to be proper, your vitamin B12 What type of folic proper. acid? Well, 5-methyl tetrahydrofolate is the preferable form because right. it's the direct link mm -hmm. then into methylation process through mm -hmm. s methionine. So you get a, a woman and, and a man who has prostate problems because this also deals with prostate as well as sure breast does. in women. So a proper methylation process through 5-methyl tetrahydrofolate and vitamin B6, vitamin B12. B12, methylcobalamin? Methylcobalamin, that's right, okay. versus the cyano. Mm -hmm. and, then, and then lastly, I think this whole concept of cruciferous vegetables and their glucosinolates, because that helps to facilitate the proper hydroxylation patterns of estrogen so it'll be eliminated correctly. So indole 3 carbonyl, methane. methane, these are uh, breakdown products from the uh, uh, Russell sprouts, cabbage, uh, cauliflower, and and um, uh, let's see, what am I missing there? Brussels sprouts, cabbage, cauliflower, and cabbage, uh, cabbage thank you, family, mm -hmm. which then uh, these glucosinolates, when they're broken down into endo-3-carbonyl and methane, facilitates the body's proper conversion of estrogen into a form that can be eliminated. So we, 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 are, we talk about you know, two to 300 milligrams of, of uh, endo-3-carbonyl or mm -hmm. methane as a way of promoting proper estrogen metabolism. And those who are struggling with obesity, oftentimes a little slightly higher dose, maybe three, 400 milligrams, sometimes people say 600 milligrams of methane might accelerate the process of shedding that body fat a little bit more yeah, efficiently. Yeah, there's a number of studies actually that have been done clinically with women who have uh, uh, what is called cervical dysplasia and, and pre, uh, uh, pre malignancy, uh, and they've been given 300 milligrams twice a day showing it reverts uh, the cells to normal architecture, it goes back away from the precancerous form. So this is a pretty powerful story. I've been following the, the story of, of acne because uh, acne, so many people are affected. Some people say that at least 80% of people in the Western culture will experience acne at some time during their life, and maybe there's over 50 million active cases going on. So I started tracing down the literature, and there seemed to be an estrogen metabolite con, uh, conversion issue. And there seemed to be that if you gave methyl donors and you did the process that you're talking about, somehow, directly or indirectly, it calmed down the androgen activity, but then along with the high plant-based diet, the sex hormone binding globulin increased, and it helped to attach to excessive amounts of androgens and or some of these harmful estrogen metabolites, and it seemed to calm down the skin. Is that possible with the yeah, acne? Because I, I have that's, a, that's, that's, a theory about that. No, I think that's more than a theory. I think that, that there would be a lot of concurrence with that model. Uh, you know, 
acne in in, uh, in women, menstruating women, yep. is uh, really, as you say, tied to this androgenic shift in their hormones, where they have more progesterone and testosterone and less uh, of the estrogen compounds, and they have more of these funny estrogens we were talking about. So normalizing that uh, estrogen metabolism and getting uh, aromatase, which is the enzyme in the in the woman's ovaries that converts androgens to estrogens to work properly. So how do you get that to happen? Well, it turns out that high levels of insulin in the body, meaning when a person is insulin resistant or pre-diabetic, mm -hmm. is the best way to blunt the conversion of testosterone to estrogens, right? So how many women that are menstruating have pre-diabetes or metabolic syndrome? A very large number. Right. So these are often the women that develop the, uh, the acne, they develop the central body fat, uh, they develop the hertzicism, facial hair, where they don't want it. And by then uh, normalizing their insulin level, by putting them on a low, on low glycemic, uh, low diet, and, and getting them in the proper exercise program, utilizing the estrogen metabolized um, uh, phytochemicals that we discussed, suddenly their acne goes away. Now, it's interesting because uh, Dr. James Anderson, and I'm not sure how many people are aware of this study out of the University of Kentucky, but what he did was he looked at the glycemic index and he said, something's not quite right. You've got these people coming in on the standard high-fat Western diet, animal-based diet, and then we're testing, uh, you know, day one, uh, carrots only, day two, you know, mm -hmm. white bread only. That was the standard, mm -hmm. interestingly mm -hmm. enough. Uh, you know, potatoes only. And they measured, you know, the obvious insulin and the glucose spike. But then Anderson stepped back and he said, hmm, what if I put them on a plant-based whole foods diet for two weeks leading up to mm -hmm. that glycemic index uh, measurement? And he found completely different results. Yeah. He found that yeah. potatoes weren't all that bad. Yep. He found that carrots were okay, and that quote sugar in the you know in, in the uh, in the pear was okay. And it did spike the insulin. Did not spike you know the insulin response. So we almost have to re-educate physicians that there's quite likely that the animal-based diet that was championed for you know trying to modulate insulin. Maybe we got to step back and look at those original studies and consider that I know most of my clients when they're on a plant-based diet without adding the extra oils, just getting fats and extra, a little bit of nuts and seeds, that their insulin levels are between the range of one, two, three, nice and low, and their glucose levels are fine. And even the diabetics that Pritikin published on over 4,000 people, they normalize their blood sugar and insulin in 30 days on a plant-based diet, yeah. rich in potatoes and vegetables and rice. So I think your point is a fantastic point because the thing that we often forget in medicine about the plant-based diet is it's bringing all these phytochemicals into the physiology, into the body that you don't get with animal products. And these phytochemicals have been discovered now over the last 10 years as having a remarkable effect on things like insulin signaling and inflammatory signaling pathways. So more than 320,000 different phytochemicals right. that we even know of, let alone how many more, Precisely. right? Precisely. So this is the wild card, right? This is what people were saying, well, they're not essential for uh, nutrition, so uh, we'll just forget about them. But over the last uh, 10 years, as we started to understand their personalities and modifying how genes are expressed and how cells do their function, we say, whoa, this array of phytochemicals that you can only get in phytos, which are plants, are extraordinarily important. So a person eating a plant-based diet for a couple of weeks builds their body's reserve of these phytochemicals that then when they're given the glucose tolerance test, boom, it's a whole Completely different, different game. Yeah. And that's so important because so many of these uh, people champion an animal-based diet, I'm not opposed to an occasional meat here or there, but saying that that's the only way to stay, stabilize insulin and, and then pointing to the glucose tolerance test and, and uh, the, you know that whole history that we just talked about.